Hey, how's everybody doing? Hi, Rick and Debs. Hi, it's awesome to see you. Uh, I'm very excited about tonight. This is uh, this should be fun. Hey, Mike Moriarty, can we have an epic start? Amen. I did sweat a little bit putting this together. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Uh, Luke chapter 1. Tonight we're going to continue our new series on the Gospels in chronological order. It's like the chosen, except this is biblical. Uh, we're going to look at the birth of John the Baptist. Uh, Luke is the only one who tells a story. We're going to look at three events in Luke 1 here, the Annunciation, the birth of John, and then we'll look at Zacharias's prophecy at the, at the end. Lots of verses, lots of great things to say. This forced me to be not wordy. Uh, so let's look at uh, Luke chapter 1, and we're just going to start with verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, let's stop there. I'll try to be quick. First, uh, Luke says, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. Now, when he says in the days of, that, that expression doesn't get a lot of love in the commentaries. Luke is not putting together some flowery bit of prose here. That was how the calendar worked in the Roman Empire. Uh, I, if And I, I won't dive too deep into this. The if I, if I have a link beneath the video to an article if anybody wants to, to dive into this subject. Long story short, the years were numbered along with the names of the Caesars. So, for example, Luke writes in chapter 3, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. That's how the calendar worked. So that's how they dated the year. So-and-so in the reign of so-and-so. We would just say, well, back in 2023. But if this was still the Roman Empire, we'd be saying, in the third year of the reign of Emperor Biden. That's I'm not making a political statement. That's just an illustration. But that's how people knew what year it was. Even their calendar was all about promoting the Roman Empire. But here in Luke 1, we have an exception. Luke doesn't mention Caesar. He mentions Herod, king of Judea. Why? Because Herod, well, especially his son, Herod Jr., is going to return later in Luke's book and in the book of Acts. So it was it's actually better for his story, for his book, to mention Herod instead of Caesar at the beginning. But notice Luke is nonspecific about the, the year of Herod's reign. He says, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. Now, you know, some general time frame within his reign, he reigned about 34 years. So at some point in the middle of his reign, in, in his reign, Jesus was born. Now, I suspect that if Luke wanted to be specific about the year, he would have had to name Caesar instead of Herod. He didn't want to name Herod. He wanted to name he didn't want to name Caesar. He wanted to name Herod because that's better for the book, better for the narrative. Hence the general time frame here. There's another point to be made about verse five. He says, 
Uh, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Notice that John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, belonged to the tribe of Levi. He, his mother, Elizabeth, was a descendant of Aaron. That makes John the Baptist a Levite. And I'd suggest that this also explains his long time in the deserts. And I'm going to explain that at the end. Verse 6. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. This verse actually came up yesterday on the podcast. What is this verse saying about John the Baptist's parents? Luke says, they were both righteous before God. What does that mean? I, I think they had God's righteousness imputed to them because of their faith. They had a righteous walk too, evidenced by the fact that they were walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless under the law. They were righteous in both position and in practice. Now look at verse 7. And they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Now, this is also another big rabbit hole, and I'm not, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. You could do a whole sermon on this. Verse 5, we had read before, told us that Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, was a priest of the course of Abia, and in this verse we learn that his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. The, this information is key if you want to try to figure out when Jesus was born. You could do a whole sermon on this. Briefly, a priest after the order of Abia is one of the 24 orders of priesthood listed in 1 Chronicles 24, all of whom served 24 different functions in the temple. Now, the course of Abia, which burned incense in the temple, was the eighth of the 24 courses. First Chronicles 24.10 is where you read about that. It's written as Abija, A-B-I-J-A-H. In any event, this means that over the course of 24 weeks, Zacharias showed up at the temple to burn incense on the eighth week. What this also means is that each order would serve seven days twice a year over the course of the Jewish 12-month calendar, which only has 30 days a month. That's just the beginning of studying the course of Abia. Um, that's where you start to try to figure out when Jesus was born, which for me was one of the most head-spinning studies of, uh, you could possibly undertake. But I also have beneath the video a link to an article in which I, I tried to figure it out, and I think I'm in the right ballpark there. Now, look at verse 10. Luke 1, verse 10. And the whole multitude, when we are, and Brad, we already established uh, John the Baptist was a Levite. Uh, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. So all the people were outside the temple while Zacharias is alone in the temple burning the incense. Verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Now, real quick, we've, we've talked about the expression angel of the Lord a number of times. In the Old Testament, an angel of the Lord was usually a, a Christophany. It was a manifestation of Christ in the flesh. But that's not all, that expression is not, doesn't mean that's always the case, especially in the New Testament. This can also be mean an angel sent by God. So to figure it out, you would have to just 
consider the context in which that expression is used to know which it is. In this context, we'll be reading in just a few minutes that this angel is Gabriel. So an angel of the Lord here is only meant to tell us that one of the Lord's angels has appeared to Zacharias. Verse 12 told us that when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. And it's interesting, you can't help but make comparisons um, with, with Daniel. When Daniel first met Gabriel, he was just as frightened. Why? Well, it's not every day you meet an angel. <laughs> We're made a little lower than the angels, so you know you're in the presence of a being that's way more powerful than you. Every human being also knows that he or she is not perfect, so there could be that thought in the back of your mind, maybe this angel's being sent by God because I did something wrong. <laughs> or I suspect there is also fear just being in the presence of something that is actually holy when you know you definitely are not. Um, now, I really love this section. We're going to read a large portion here. Uh, look at verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor st strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. I got to say real quick, that's just an un unbelievable reaction from Zacharias. He's afraid of the angel. And then when the angel gives him good news, he doubts him. Uh, verse 19. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stands in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. All right. There's a lot to say here. Let's first talk about Gabriel. I suspect that what happened here was a vision. Now, when Zacharias leaves the temple, he's visibly shaken and he's unable to speak and he's motioning with his hands. Verse 22 told us that the people perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. They're probably right. Uh, you can't help but also compare Gabriel's interaction with Daniel to his interaction here with Zacharias. Gabriel was very <laughs> matter of fact, just as he was with Daniel when he appeared to him in a vision. And yet next week, we'll read that Gabriel will make a personal appearance to Mary. And his personal appearance to Mary conveys the immense importance 
of what's going to be said about that miraculous virgin birth of the Messiah. And the same thing happened with Daniel. Gabriel first appeared in a vision to give this epic interpretation about that ram and the goat. And then later, Gabriel shows up in person to Daniel to give him that prophetic timetable of 70 weeks. So when Gabriel shows up in a vision, that's important. <laughs> it's a big deal. When Gabriel shows up in person, he's about to give you news so big it'll rock the prophetic program. Gabriel tells Zacharias here that he stands in the presence of God. What class of angels abides in the presence of God? We know that's cherubims. And just for the fact that we're given his name, he must be, I, th I think, a high-ranking angel. We're given few names of angels in scriptures, and the names were the names we are given were always high-ranking angels. And Gabriel means God is my strength. That's all I'll say about Gabriel. Now, I think most of this uh, section that we read was pretty straightforward, but I want to point out a couple of small things. Uh, look at verse 15. Gabriel says, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Now, we're told that John will be filled by the spirit, filled with the spirit from the womb. Why? Now, you might remember in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did one of two things. He either filled a person or he came upon that person. To have the Spirit upon you was pretty simple. That, was, that person was empowered to accomplish one thing, one specific, extraordinary task by the Spirit. That when the Spirit is upon you, it could be short-term and it could also be long-term. We saw short-term enablements uh, we, when we studied this years ago, we saw short-term enablements in the story of Samson. When he had the spirit on him and he killed that lion and the thousand Philistines, a long-term enablement of having that spirit upon you would be exemplified by the prophets and their lifelong ministries to the people. The spirit being upon them helped them to speak the words of the Lord to the people accurately. It helped them to be able to write down the words of the Lord accurately onto, their, onto those parchments. On the other hand, being filled with the spirit was more complex. It was he was he was basically spiritually downloading wisdom and knowledge into their brains. <laughs> you uh, examples of the Old Testament saints who were filled with the Spirit: Ezekiel, Bezalel, and Aaron and his sons. They were all filled with the Spirit. You might remember. The, uh, and why was that? To be filled with the Spirit was a kind of partnership with the Spirit. They were sharing with the Spirit in some of the supernatural qualities that the Spirit possessed, or they were getting supernatural wisdom and knowledge, and they gained skills as well. In order to carry out the will of God, which could only be done in a miraculous fashion. So, for example, Bezalel, in the first five verses of Exodus 31, the Lord uh, anointed Bezalel to construct all the artifacts of gold, silver, and brass that would go inside the tabernacle. He would learn how to do that supernaturally when he was filled with the Spirit. The Spirit filled him to give him knowledge so he could gain the skills needed to, to create those artifacts for the tabernacle. Uh, Bezalel was filled with the Spirit. That was short-term. On the other hand, Aaron and his sons were filled long-term so that they could all properly minister in their new priestly roles. So in all of those, in all three of those Old Testament cases, we have the supernatural downloading of wisdom and knowledge from the Holy Spirit, the gaining of skills all miraculously from the Spirit, who is teaching and guiding them and moving them from within their own bodies. 
So to be filled with the Spirit in the Old Testament was a, a kind of just a partnership. I don't know how else to explain. A miraculous sharing with the Spirit of wisdom and knowledge to accomplish something miraculous. And this brings us back to the question, why was John the Baptist filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb? For all the same reasons, Ezekiel, Bezalel, and Aaron and his sons, to be to supernaturally be taught, to gain from the Spirit His knowledge and His wisdom, to be perfectly trained, perfectly knowledgeable, perfectly raised up by God to perform the role that God had called Him to do. This task of going before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This task was so monumental. God would personally train John himself. God would personally ready John for the role of readying the people for the Lord. And I find that just astounding. Now, Gabriel would say in verse 16, (coughs) And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. So when we think of the Gospels, and you think of the Lord's ministry overall, we generally view the whole thing as a kind of failure. You know, he came into his own, and his own received him not. But Gabriel would have us know in advance that John the Baptist will ha- will be a great success in terms of numbers of conversions. He will turn many hearts to the Lord their God. And Gabriel isn't he isn't saying this because he's confident that John the Baptist is going to be a success. He, no, he's saying this definitively because God told him to say this because God for because of God's foreknowledge. He knew John was going to be a success. And then Gabriel would say in verse 17, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, this is also a fascinating bit of text. John the Baptist shall go before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now, hold your place here. Flip over to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. While they're doing that, I'll say hello to everybody. John Snodgrass, Norma Garcia, Marvin Embry, Ludis, our sweet sister. Hey, Daisy, what's going on? It's awesome to see you guys. All right, Matthew 17. This is after the transfiguration. Matthew 17 and verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And it was just a fantastic question. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. And then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Uh, Matthew 17, 10 to 13, we read. So what's going on here? I think this is arguably one of the smartest questions the disciples ever asked, frankly. What's going on with that prophecy about John the, about, about Elijah? You know, there's that prophecy in Malachi about Elijah coming first. Well, what, 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 we haven't seen Elijah. Where, what's going on with Elijah is what they're saying. Is John the Baptist a fulfillment of what was said about Elijah, preparing the way for the Lord? You know, that's legit great question. I'd be asking that question. John would certainly fulfill Isaiah 40, verse 3. 
famous verse. John would fulfill Isaiah 43. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John fulfills that verse. But John will not be a fulfillment of Malachi 4.5 talking about Elijah. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now we will read tonight in verse 80 that John is going to be spending a lot of time in the deserts <laughs> until the day of the Lord's appearing, which is similar to Elijah in some respects. Uh, he was known, Elijah was known for long periods of isolation. John was also similar to Elijah in the sense that he wore camel's hair. Elijah was a very hairy guy. <laughs> when the Israeli leaders uh, began to hear about John and how his ministry was similar to Elijah, they sent messengers to find out who he was. And John's appearance was so ugly to them, it seemed, yeah, I think Elijah really has come. So the question the disciples asked the Lord here was really fantastic. What about Elijah? What's going on? When they asked that question, they didn't realize that there's going to be two comings of the Lord. It's still true what the Lord said in Matthew 17, 11, that Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. What Malachi wrote is also still true. God will send Elijah down to this earth before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Elijah coming back as one of the two witnesses during the tribulation. But what about that other verse? The Lord said in verse 12 here, he says, But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not. But have done unto him whatsoever they listed, likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. What did the Lord mean by that? Well, Luke already explained that to us in Luke 1.17. John the Baptist shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Elijah is come already as a type in John the Baptist. He went before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Every word the Lord said to the disciples, just as they are written, are true. Elijah has come as a type in John the Baptist, and Elijah truly shall come again as one of the two witnesses. And I tell you, that is absolutely brilliant. I, that is just mind-blowing brilliant. Uh, yeah? In a traditional Jewish home today, on one of their feast celebrations, one of their meals, they have a custom always set an extra place setting at the table and that's for Elijah and then, the then <laughs> yeah. The yeah 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 and then somebody knocks at the door they send one of the children to go to answer the door to see if it's alive <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious uh okay here's another question how is it that John would make ready a people prepared for the Lord what is it what does that mean exactly now we're going to explore this when we look closer at John's ministry and everything he says, but primarily, John would get the people to have faith in Christ before Christ would even appear on the scene. Now, you remember what Paul said of John the Baptist in Acts 19. In Acts 19, in the first, I don't know, the 10 verses, Paul's talking to members of the little flock, and he explains to them John the Baptist's ministry, he says in Acts 19.4, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So John was primarily sent to prepare the people to accept Christ by faith. And they were to accept Christ by faith the moment John proclaimed it. They didn't have to wait until Christ showed up on the scene to, to accept him by faith. And I think that 
if the people had accepted by faith what John the Baptist said, that the one who would come after him is the Messiah, I think they already got saved even before they saw Jesus. Now here's another question. Look at, uh, let's go back to Luke 1 and look at verse 20. Luke 1, verse 20. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak <laughs> until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Now, we know why Gabriel made Zacharias unable to speak, because he didn't believe his words. We get that. But why did Gabriel say, Thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak. What's the difference? Now, dumb in this sense suggests that there is a physical imperfection or some kind of debility in his organs that would prevent him from speaking. And I suspect there might be an element of mental retardation, incapacity. Um, so Gabriel is explaining what the judgment is and how it will work. He won't be able to speak because there will now be a kind of debility to his mouth, his tongue, his mind, whatever. Something like that. But why was his judgment an inability to speak? One commentary said... <laughs> Hey, he asked for a sign, and he got it. <laughs> well, it's perfect justice, right? Since he spoke words of unbelief about this prophecy, then he will be unable to speak until this prophecy will be fulfilled, right? And that will be a sign to him <laughs> that every word the angel spoke to him was the very truth of God. And then at the end of this section, we read in uh, verse 23, And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me, in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. What does she mean by that? To be barren was often viewed as a reproach from the Lord. Because of her old age, she hid herself from the people to keep quiet this miraculous birth and probably to protect John's life too. Now we also read in verse 23, and it came to pass, as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house, and after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived. Now that phrase, as soon as, uh, that soon, there was no room for, there's no interval here. After those days means Elizabeth conceived right after Zacharias' ministry in the temple. He immediately went home to her. So you look at the 24 courses then, and the 8th course, you learn that Zacharias was usually in the temple in the second week of Tammuz, the fourth month on the Jewish calendar, which for us would be end of June and beginning of, or the beginning of July. I, I like to have a, a, a window of 30 days in case it's a, a, a pregnant year. So Elizabeth's conception had to have been at the end of June or the beginning of July. You have to get, and I, again, I think you have to give yourself a window of 30 days in the possibility it might be a pregnant year. So after this computing, after this, you know, computing the time frame of the Lord's birth is pretty straightforward. We'll read in a few minutes in Luke 1 57 that John was not a premature baby. He was a perfect birth. His mother carried him a full nine months. Luke 1 26 and 36 would tell us that Elizabeth conceived six months before Mary which would make John six months older than Jesus. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 6 shows us that Jesus was also not premature. Uh, that verse says, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. In other words, these were both perfect nine-month 
terms. These were perfect pregnancies, perfect births. So you look at a nice Jewish calendar, you compare it to our calendar, you give yourself a window of 30 days for the pregnant year. Elizabeth conceived six months before Mary. Jesus was born nine months later. Six months plus nine months is 15 months from the time Elizabeth conceived until the time Jesus was born. This means that Elizabeth conceived end of June, beginning of July. Mary had to have conceived end of December or beginning of January. That's six months later. Elizabeth would have given birth end of March or early April, right about now, in fact. And Mary had to have given birth to Jesus end of September or uh, beginning of October that same year. Uh, okay, so let's look at the birth of John the Baptist. Uh, look down at verse uh, 57. Luke 1. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed. And he spake and praised God. Fear came on all that dwelt round about them. And all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. It's funny to me. In verse 58, Elizabeth, in her old age, couldn't hide her pregnancy from her neighbors or her cousins, and they all rejoiced with her. <laughs> now, I think God chose Elizabeth in her old age because older women giving birth is a great miracle that would remind everyone of Abraham and Sarah. They would see that miracle and instinctively know that God's hand is involved in this. And then we had this discussion about John's name. Uh, you know, in, in verse 63, he asked for a writing table, a tablet, and wrote saying his name is John, and they marveled all. Why did they marvel after Zacharias wrote that? Because Zacharias, I suspect, was quickly recovering from his condition. <laughs> and he would more than recover. He would actually speak again, and when he speaks, he praises God. And fear came on all that dwelt round about them, and all those sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with them. Now these were country folk, <laughs> faithful country folk. These, were, these faithful people flipped out because they knew exactly what was going on. They knew the Lord's hand was in on this. They knew this was a sign. They knew this child was special. And they knew this was most likely evidence that the Messiah would soon be here. I mean, you talk about viral news. <laughs> this story swept across Israel faster than wildfire. And I think the people were already in a state of anticipation at by this point. You remember, God was very specific about the prophetic timetable. They knew from Daniel 9.25 that from the time Artaxerxes the king gives the commandment to restore Jerusalem unto the Messiah shall be a total of 483 years. So they knew they were getting close. So a miracle birth like Elizabeth's an angelic vision for Zacharias. He was made dumb, and now he's recovered miraculously. Those signs wouldn't be lost on faithful saints who know their Bibles. 
Word about this spread wide and far. And I can't help but think of my old pastor up in Springfield. One of the few things that have stuck with me when I was young, Marv Wiseman. And he once talked about this moment in time. And he, I just, rem- I don't know how accurate my memory is, but I just remember he, he painted this portrait at night. Uh, in this this child, this young boy in bed, you know, he's looking up at the stars, he's dreaming about the Lord's kingdom, and he's thinking to himself, maybe tomorrow, you know, maybe tomorrow will be the day. Maybe I'll get to see the Messiah. And then suddenly, tomorrow became literally became today with the news that the kingdom is at hand. And you just imagine how the people must have felt when they heard that. That news must have been just absolutely electrifying to all the people of Israel. And this brings us to Zechariah's prophecy. Look down at verse 67. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And now, child shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. (laughs) I love that. Now, Zacharias' message never fails to move me. Um, I love the, I love this passage. I love using this to make uh, distinctions. It, it sets the stage for all the Gospels. Now, first, let me answer the question. What did it mean for Zacharias to be filled with the Spirit and prophesied? Does that mean he, he was possessed, you know, and the Spirit was speaking through him like a, you know, Christianized version of exorcist, you know? No. Being filled with the Spirit was never a betrayal of man's free will. Um, that you can uh, that would be evidenced by the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts five. They were filled with the Spirit, and yet they also sinned. They lied to the Holy Spirit. Peter exposed their lies and sins, and they and it actually cost them their lives. So it is possible to sin and even lie to the Spirit while they're filled with the Spirit. But in in Zacharias's case, making him silent all this time. <laughs> He was, I think, ready to burst with praise to God for nine months. <laughs> he could not wait. He was super excited about what God was doing with Elizabeth and his son. He knew all this meant the Messiah was here. He couldn't wait to praise God. And in this moment, Zacharias had just allowed himself to yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit and say what the Spirit moved him to say. And this, to me, this speech is absolutely epic. For anyone who may be new to right division, notice how Israel-centered this speech is. 
He's filled with the Spirit. He's speaking prophecy, which means he's sharing the words of God himself. And he first speaks of what God had already promised to Israel. This was about Israel. And this would be about Israel's ultimate deliverance from all her enemies and all her sin, which, is, which will take place in the tribulation. And this would also be about Israel receiving all that was promised to the fathers and to Father Abraham. Israel would serve their Messiah in holiness and righteousness all the days of their lives. And his son, Zacharias' son, was going to be the prophet of the highest. And his son would go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. And his son would give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Which I think goes back to his call for faith in, in the one who comes after him. And how can you not love him saying in verse 78, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in, and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. He didn't say the word kingdom here, but he's sure talking about it. Peace, of course, we all know, being one of the preeminent characteristics of the Lord's literal earthly millennial kingdom. The peace on this earth will be as endless as the Lord's authority over this earth. And I love how the story ends in verse 80. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Okay, so the child grew and became strong in spirit. What did he mean by that, strong in spirit? He, John grew up learning how to yield to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, which made his inner man strong in every way. Strong in faith, strong in wisdom, strong in knowledge, strong in confidence and in courage. And then probably in his early teens, he leaves home. He left home and, as, and the child grew. So once he was after his childhood and he waxed strong, he leaves home, which I suspect would be early teens. And he lives for a couple of decades in the deserts. Notice it's deserts, plural. More than one desert. He traveled. He got around. And my thought was, well, what deserts is, there, is he talking about here? Well, I, the, the generally thought to be the Judean deserts west of the Dead Sea. And that's a big piece of real estate. Okay, so so you mean so you mean to tell me that Joel that John was isolated from everyone until he was about 30? Yes. And I suspect God wanted this because John was a Levite. Now you now Numbers 8, 24 and 25 tells us that a male Levite became a priest at 25 years old, but Years later, in 1 Chronicles 23-27, David would lower the age from 25 to 20 to become a priest, a Levitical priest. And I have no doubt they would begin preparing those kids for their roles in their teens. God didn't want that for John. God wanted to prepare John himself, prepare John to be able to prepare the people for the Lord. John would not be brought up in the schools of the prophets, nor in the academies of the Jews, nor at the feet of any prestigious rabbis and have the appearance of being influenced by some kind of faction. He would be unknown. He would come out of the deserts to preach in the wilderness, fulfilling prophecy, and God wanted John to begin his ministry at 30 years. So John the Baptist had to get away from everyone at an early age. In fact, he needed to leave as soon as he was no longer a child, probably in his early teens. And this kid 
<laughs> filled with the Spirit, managed to survive in the deserts on his own for years. Frank Herbert's got nothing on John the Baptist. But I guarantee John loved his time in the deserts. He was filled with the Spirit. He was in constant communion with God, which had to be thrilling. I just can't imagine how endlessly satisfying it would be to be in contact with the Creator. He was in constant communication with God, which just had to be thrilling. And he never needed anything else. I think John probably loved living the way he did in the deserts because his constant communion with God was just endlessly satisfying. So you could live in the barren deserts wearing nothing but camel's hair, <laughs> eating locusts and wild honey, and that'd be the greatest life you could dream of because nothing compares to intimate, loving, back and forth communication, literal communication with God and learning from God, which I think is just amazing. Uh, so next week we'll talk about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody have any thoughts, suggestions? Yeah. I know they were priests, and I know we're saying that Levites were, were the Levite the tribe of Levi, were they more than the ten that were carried off? And so, how do they continue? If they were, how do we continue to identify Levitical priests? Uh, great question. You uh, figure it out and let me know, brother. I don't know. I'm asking I don't know. I don't know. I'll look it up. I don't know. God knows. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> Even stump Sue. Yeah. Did I, did I miss or did you not say uh, use uh, David and Paul Oh, yeah. I did have it in there, but I cut it out because this was getting long. But yeah, a short, the spirit was upon David and Saul, and the spirit could also potentially, it could be short term because if you misbehave, the spirit might leave you. <laughs> That's why you had David saying, don't take the spirit away from me. Yes, he did. I don't understand why Zacharias got punished because it seemed to me like everyone who was in that situation had the same response. I mean, Sarah laughed. Mary said, "How can that be? I haven't known a man." I mean, they all questioned it. It was a a, a number of reasons. It was assigned to him, but it was also assigned to everybody else. Signed to everybody else. Everybody's going to see what happened to him, and they know God's hand is in on this because God shut him up and God let him speak. They knew all of that was miraculous. I guess the, the, whole, the whole scene of certainly Jesus being born, I mean, that's like dropping in behind enemy lines, and you don't want to tip off your hand and sit. <laughs> yeah. I, I, exactly. I had that thought too. John, it's probably like telling me something. It's like telling the media. Everybody's going to find out about it. And so, you know, I'm going to. Take this opportunity to shut him up for nine months, right? And uh, it was, you know, it, Elizabeth, even after she conceived, she hid herself for five months. Yeah, but wasn't it common back in the day for women to not go out in public? Yes, them? it was. And, but in Elizabeth's case, I think it was particularly important to keep it a secret because you're going to have, they find out you got some miracle thing going on, everybody in Israel is going to come visit you, you know. Um, which I totally would understand, and they still had a hard time keeping it contained within the family. Yeah. The other thing was, was John out in the desert being taught by the Lord, reminding me of Paul being taken to in Arabia. Arabia. That's right. Yeah. Taught by the Lord. Brother Mike with the yeah. buzz cut. Maybe I got this wrong, but um, you had, I think, mentioned that the birth of John the Baptist was basically a miracle birth. Right. What way do you think? Uh, Elizabeth was when she I have no idea. She was elderly. She was old. That's all we know. We know Sarah. We know her. Yeah, it was nowhere near that old. Yeah. Yeah. That was a different time and they would live longer then and I don't think they were anywhere near that old in uh in the Bible days. But I have no idea. But Zacharias kind of comes across to me a little bit as a cranky old fart, you know, when he I mean, an angel appears in front of him, and he's all scared. And then he's like, well, how am I going to know this is? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. My question, would you term that, though, as a miracle birth? Yeah. You don't. Yeah. I do. She was barren. She was barren, and she was, oh, and she was, she was, barren and she was elderly uh, on both counts. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. They, and so when, and, and that was, I don't know if she would be, if you would consider her to be barren because of anything she did. I think she was barren for the sole purpose of making her birth, the birth of John the Baptist, a clear miracle that would send shockwaves through Israel about the coming of the Messiah. Did you have something, Sonia? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah is was not this. I mean, she was. I never did like the way she treated Hagar and stuff. You, you know, she's the one who set Hagar up for failure here and then punished her for it. I mean, it's it was really crude what she did to her. Yeah, so I understand why Abraham would a couple of times say, yeah, she's my sister, take her. You can have her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, Brad. Did I mention this already to maybe on Sunday? But did you encounter any in your research of any sort of material or articles or books that talked about the Sadducees usurped the office of the high priest. So it wasn't rightfully there. Oh. And and Zechariah was in line to be the rightful high priest. No, so I didn't read his that. His son was also in line to be the rightful high priest. So mm. when Jesus was baptized uh, in the Jordan, he was truly being endorsed, anointed, pick your word, mm. by the true and rightful high priest. Right. Yeah, but that's why they murdered him, right? Zechariah yeah. they murdered him. Mm. Uh, no, I did not encounter that. Um, I'm sticking with the, most of the Baker's book. I'm going to go through the book that you gave me. And uh, uh, I got um, uh, just a few commentaries. Not, I'm not doing much. I, uh, I've gone through this a, a few times already. and I, uh, so, um, But yeah, no, I had not heard that. He talked about Sadducees having taken over the high priest and they murdered Zacharias. And it was interesting. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> the thing where it said, um, you said that um, Gabriel was a vision. I think that people thought he was yeah. a vision, but Gabriel said, I was sent to speak. Yeah. And the only reason I say that, and you can, you're welcome. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fight with anybody on that. And the only reason I say that is because it just seems like the, these encounters with Gabriel par is, is parallel. It's similar to what happened with Daniel. He appeared to Daniel in a vision first and then in person. And I, I get the impression the same thing's going on here, but I could, I could very well be wrong. That's for sure. Oh, that's a great point. I like that. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh yeah, there you go. That's what I thought too. Now the uh, what do you think? I I I um I couldn't come. I couldn't find any explanation that satisfied me why everybody marveled after he wrote "No, his name is John" on that tablet. Why would they marvel after he wrote that down? Because they followed the normal naming right. traditions, and they should have named him Zacharias. Okay. So okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I like that too. Um, and uh, another point I wanted to make is I'm trying to keep the outlines short so that, I, that we can have time to interact too. So, because in this series, you're, you're going to need a lot of discussion. I'm definitely going to be wrong about a lot of stuff. That's for sure. Uh, anybody else? All right. I'm studying the scriptures about uh, there's six women in the Bible who were barren, who God then gave them. A son oh, who was influential yep. in love that. the direction of Israel, and Elizabeth is one of them. Yeah, yeah, love that. Uh, yeah, I skipped over the part where she meets Mary. We'll go through that next week. And the and the babe leaped in the womb. Um, I wonder why the unofficial women, woman leader of our church and group knows about the women in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's great a great study, body. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, how about a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, 
how much we love you and uh, uh, how thrilled we are to be able to go through this entire gospel period and uh, just be wowed by everything. And uh, I just pray, Father, everybody else will be excited about digging into Scripture and uh, studying for themselves uh, these amazing stories. And I just lift everybody up here and online. And I just pray that they'll be shining trophies of your grace. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Hey, we'll be back here on Friday. Uh, Open chat Friday. So come on back. See you.